Robin Hood Radio and the Robin Hood Radio Network is proud to present Leonard Lopate at Large, lively hour-long in-depth discussions providing overviews and context to topics usually covered in partial measures. His guests include leading thinkers, scientists, artists, economists, farmers, historians, authors, and politicians. Mr. Lopate is a Peabody Award winner whose numerous honors include three Associated Press Awards and three James Beard Awards. And welcome to Leonard Lopate at Large. I'm Leonard Lopate. In 1986, not long after former United Nations Secretary General Kurt Waldheim launched his campaign to become the president of Austria, revelations about his conduct during World War II called into question his story that, after he was drafted into the Nazi army like thousands of other Austrians, he was wounded in 1941 and set out sat out the rest of the war to focus on his studies. What followed is the subject of writer-director Ruth Beckerman's powerful new film. It's an award-winning film. It is Austria's entry for this year's Oscar in the foreign language area, and it's called The Waldheim Waltz. I'm very pleased to welcome her to our show now. Hello. also should point out that it opens next Friday at the Metrograph Theater. Um, an arch conservative and anti immigrant government coalition led by Chancellor Sebastian Kurz was swept into power in Austria just last December. In light of what we learned from your film, I guess we shouldn't be surprised. Mm, well, uh, actually, this is third, more than 30 years later, and um, I think Austria changed a lot after the Waldheim affair. It was a real turning point. I mean, nobody would say Austria is the first victim of the German Nazis today. The whole generation... But for uh, many years they did say that Austria was a victim and, yeah. and, and, and really not really complicit. It was forced to do what it did. But this um, lie broke down when during the campa campaign, during the Waldheim campaign, and he still was elected, but after his election, many, many discussions started about Austria's involvement in the Nazi era. So how do we explain the fact that Austria is the first Western European country since World War II to vote in a far-right government as extreme as this one? There are even neo-Nazis in the coalition. Right. That's terrible. And unfortunately, Austria is not the only one. We have Italy now, a uh, government of the extreme right. We have Hungary and Poland and many other countries, yeah. even Germany, where the extreme right is rising. And this has many reasons. Um, and um, unfortunately, Austria is not the only one anymore. Has this brought about more open anti-Semitism? Because you, uh, you have footage in your film of people making anti-Semitic statements over 30 years ago in defense of all time. One man says, you know who controls the world. <laughs> yeah, well, at the time they used anti-Semitism because the alle allegation against Waldheim uh, came not only from Austrian journalists who had found uh, documents that he was member of the Nazi youth movement and he had lied about his past, as you said before. But the allegations also came from the World Jewish Congress and uh, so the hostile other at the time were the Jews. Today, this government we have right now uh, used uh, xenophobia, racism, Islamophobia, to win the elections. It was not anti-Semitism this time. After World War II, Germany had to work out uh, an understanding of its Nazi past, uh, and it was rather painful, uh, done in fits and starts. How did uh, Austria react? Did it go through a similar reckoning? No, Austria had a good way out. I mean, there was the Moscow Declaration uh, by the Allies in 1943, um, saying that Austria, military-wise, was the first victim because the German army, the Wehrmacht, marched into Austria 
1938. The Anschluss. The Anschluss. But they didn't... S okay, Austria took this to call itself victim. But in fact, Austrians greeted the Germans and waved and were happy and... Uh, welcomed them and Hitler was Austrian, Eichmann was Austrian, Kaltenbrunner, many others. So they tried to forget or they uh, uh, made the world believe that o they were only victims. And is that the, what, what children were taught in school? Mm, for a long time, yes. But as I said before, after the Waldheim affair, many school books were, all the school books were rewritten. And today, nobody would say that anymore. How did Waldheim even wind up becoming the Secretary General of the UN, um, a man who was dubbed the man the world trusts? <laughs> well, he became Secretary General in the beginning of the 70s. Austria was a neutral, or still is a neutral country. We were in the middle of uh, the Cold War. So it was uh, obvious that they chose someone from a neutral country and the Russians accepted him, the Americans accepted him. Maybe the Russians and the Yugoslavs knew about his past. They probably did. Um, but, you know, at the beginning of the 70s, uh, the, the world didn't really focus on the Holocaust and the real victims of the Nazis, the Jews, the Roma, the homosexuals, but more on how the war went on, resistance, you know, there were other themes in the foreground. So m probably they didn't even check him. He was Secretary General of the UN for nine years, and, and you say no one questioned whether he'd played a role in the SA or the, the Nazi party. Actually, as I understand it, the CIA had documents that... Uh, that had been seized from Germany that revealed that they didn't tell anybody? Uh, as, as you can see in the film, the congressman Solas had written a letter to Waltham asking him several questions, but there were never any documents on the table that he had been involved in any war crimes. You uh, also have him denying having spent any time in what was then Yugoslavia during the war, <laughs> and, and that wasn't true. Yeah, and he bluntly said it into the face of Marshal Tito, who asked him when he came with the then uh, president of Austria to Yugoslavia, and uh, Waldheim had said, uh, you have such a beautiful country here. And Tito said, have you never been here? And Waldheim answered, no. So he just lied. Maybe he believed well, his own lies after it? all those years. How long had he spent time in Yugoslavia and Greece? Well, more or less two years. Mm. The last two years of the war. Uh, how would you describe his tenure at the UN? Was he considered a good secretary general? Because when we, when we think back, at the Dag Hammarskjöld is still remembered with yeah. great warmth. Uh, he was there nine years. That's a yeah, he was long not. Time. He was insignificant. But of course, it was the time when many countries became independent. It was the time of anti-colonialism. It was the time when the PLO um, got accepted. Arafat uh, spoke at the UN. So I think that was also, that was, might have been one of the reasons why the World Jewish Congress didn't like him a lot. Hugh Burtis Chernin, an investigative journalist, began looking into what uh, Waldheim had done during the war after Waldheim left the UN in 1982. Um, when did you start filming the response? Which is well, when did you, well, you started, you, a lot of the footage in this film is from you. you were you oh, shooting? No, I was shooting during the campaign in, in 1986. As a filmmaker or just because you were curi because you mm. were somebody who was involved in the protests against fall time? Well, both. Uh, I was already a filmmaker. I've made a couple of films at the time, but I was very much involved in the protest and I never thought of making a film out of this. It was more the reason why I filmed was because official TV, Austrian TV, ignored us. 
And it was. You mean the, the protesters? Yes. Um, and it was the time before internet, so Austrians could watch only Austrian TV, and uh, they they tried to to they, they never interviewed us. They never showed what we did and what we sought. Was it clear to you that what you were seeing was of historical importance? You know, when you're in the middle of something, we just wanted him not to be elected. That was our goal. I mean, we didn't think of ourselves as historical objects or important people. What made you revisit those VS, VHS tapes in, in 2013? Well, they were so just sitting on my shelves. And uh, one day I had uh, young people at my home and we we watched those tapes and uh, I've been shocked because I'd forgotten this this outburst of anti-Semitism in the streets of Austria and those young people they asked so many questions and they said yeah he was a liar and you should make a film about him because there are so many politicians who are lying like Nixon did and others uh, so I got interested in it and I started to to go into the archives and myself I knew only what Austrian television had transmitted so I started to look into BBC and American archives French archives Does to get the broader you, picture was YouTube already available to you what things like YouTube when in At 80 that time. there was no internet no no so. no I mean when you started uh, looking of course, of course but on YouTube you don't find a lot of material oh. uh, they promise to supply you with a lot of material, but uh, well, but you but you found it in all the other archives. We don't want to make <laughs> um, advertising here. <laughs> I'm speaking to the director of a new documentary called "The Valtheim Waltz," Ruth Beckerman, uh, on Leonard Lopez at large on WBAI New York 99.5 FM. Uh, you say when you were when you st looked at those tapes you were struck by the the modern day parallels not only in austria but also among other things the election of donald trump yes of course but when i started uh, to work on this project uh, there was no donald trump around i think uh, i mean and i didn't expect that the film would be so timely when but it, there was when already populism of, uh, right when populism is there all the time i mean in in different countries and I think the mechanisms are always the same. I mean, well, I so. I always wonder why countries that were destroyed to some degree by what happened during the Nazi era and the war, and you mentioned Hungary and Poland and Austria and Germany and France uh, and uh, and Italy, they are are the, the the memories of what happened so so short. Uh, do people are people not aware of how destructive all of this was? Yes, but uh, you know, first of all, those people are not alive anymore. Most of the people who lived through World War Two, and second, I mean, history doesn't repeat itself. We we are in a very different situation today. Europe faces the question of immigration and couldn't find a solution for that yet meaning um, regulated, uh, united um, way to deal with immigration. So, um, and, and of course there were families of Nazis who transmitted this ideology to their kids. But um, it's a different world, I mean, and we never learn of history. I mean, we rewrite history all the time for our present use. It's not that uh, if you gain anything once, it's forever. Every generation has to fight again for a liberal, open society. Isn't it kind of ironic that the immigration uh, or, and of the, that era, the Nazi era, was out of Europe, people escaping it, and uh, now it's people coming to Europe to escape terrible things happening in their homelands, and Europeans have no sense of of the well, not only the irony of it, but the the fact that uh, in the end lives are saved. 
Do the Americans have this sense? I mean, so many people escape to the U.S. and uh, ask well, we them what they think about refugees coming from other uh, countries, if they want to take them in or not. Well, we, even, then, even then we had restrictive immigration laws, and we've had them all along throughout our history. Uh, and when they finally were pretty much eliminated, that has opened up this latest spasm of anti-immigrant sentiment in this country. Well, you see, it's the same in Europe. But in, but this country was made up of immigrants, and yet we don't seem to remember that. Mm. Um, you were born into a Jewish family, but you say that you don't always agree with your parents on politics. What were the differences? Well, um, when I was young, we didn't agree that they... Uh, lived in Austria or Germany again after what had happened. We didn't agree on their views. Well, you felt you shouldn't be living there? I, I went, I left Austria many times for different reasons, but also because I didn't like to live there. And it was not easy for a Jewish kid to live there in the 60s and 70s. Really? Because Why? there was a lot of anti-Semitism. Still? Uh, yeah in school, religious, even religious anti-Semitism, saying that we don't know about Jesus and so on and so on. Um, but uh, we also didn't agree with our parents about capitalism. We were much more to the left. And uh, we didn't agree about their view on Israeli politics. Um, defending every Israeli government, whoever it was. So there were men, I mean, when you, that's normal, you don't agree with your parents. So the, were they critical of, of all time? Because uh, uh, he was very critic. he criticized Israel, Israeli politics over the years. I think this was the agenda of the World Jewish Congress. That's why they criticized him. I mean, this was behind this whole uh, affair for the Americans. Uh, they didn't care so much about Austria, but they found something to criticize the UN. He, uh, he was criticized for in particular for his handling of the Entebbe uh, affair. Yeah. What happened? Well, it was then? really terrible. I mean, well, a lot of people don't remember that. Although uh, there, I think there's even been a film made uh, about mm. what happened in Tebby. But can you give us uh, the the brief story? Um, well, uh, the, the, there was a airplane hijacked and uh, landed in Entebbe, and an Israeli uh, group of soldiers, Mossad people, entered and 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 freed the, the victims and Waldheim had said as far as I remember they shouldn't have done that they shouldn't a have acted on uh, foreign territory it's not, like he that. said it's not okay to intervene in, in a foreign country's affairs mm -hmm. well uh, I, I think most people would agree that what the Israeli defense uh, sure. did in that sure. case was, was the right thing to do sure. t to free these these people who were being held hostage. Uh, he also um, criticized uh, Israel for the war in Lebanon, which outraged a lot of uh, mm. supporters of Israel. He was, uh, yeah, he was uh, very much siding with the Arabs and, I mean, but he had not very much power. He made these statements, which were not okay, but um, I mean, as a Secretary General of the U UN, you don't have a lot of power. It's the member states who vote. And it was, as I said, it was the time when many African states became independent. So it was, for them, it was quite natural to vote against Israel as they perceived Israel as a colonial country. Even though Israel had had good relations with any number of the African At countries. At the time, yes, yes. Right. Now, he... He uh, he was running for president of Austria, not chancellor. What's the difference there? Well, the president has more or less no power. Oh, it's kind uh, of a figurehead? A, yeah, yeah. It's a representative um, going to other countries or giving dinners for heads of states and stuff. But nobody came. I mean, he was quite isolated. 
in his villa and um, or in his office because nobody visited Austria. I mean, there were some Arabs or I think Russians came, but he was invited only to Arab countries and the Vatican. Well, he was then prohibited from entering the United States yeah. once it was a apparent that his war record was what it was. Yeah, he was put on the watch list in 1987. Uh, so that's, no, 1987, that's right after the election. One so year later, yeah. And the Austrians had thought after the election everything would calm down, but it didn't. And yet he remained president for, for how many years? Five. Uh, he decided not to run for re-election. No. But do you think he would have been reelected? No, no. Everybody was happy that this was over because the country was isolated. So many artists didn't come, musicians, uh, heads of state. So it was a big problem for Austria. You began this film project in 2013 and spent a lot of time looking through archives, as you said, in Austria and elsewhere. And then you took a break in 2016 to work on another film. What made you want to s stop working on this film? It was not uh, like that. I had this opportunity to make a beautiful love story and my first uh, kind of fiction film, and that's why I stopped. Mm -hmm. And that, what happened with that film? Oh, it was released. It was uh, successful. It was showing in many countries and... And then you went back to this Yeah, in, in, this film was, was The Dreamed Ones, is the title. Mm -hmm. I finished it in, in 2016, and then I went back to work on Waldheim. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Now, what led Waldheim to leave his job at the UN as Secretary General after nine years? Did he just... He was not elected for a third term. The Chinese refused. And what was their reason for not I wanting don't know. to support Nobody him? knows. Um, do do we know whether he was already thinking of running for president of, of Austria at the time? Yeah, he was. He was. And it was at that point that journalists began to question uh, that three-year gap in his resume? Yeah, I don't, we don't know what made them question his past or his version of his past, but uh, it was in, in the beginning of 1986 that they found the documents. He was favored to win, even with all these serious questions that were being raised about his resume. He was one. Wasn't uh, he favored to win? Yeah, he, he was, uh, I mean, every, everybody thought he would wi win. The, the um, Socialist Party even thought of uh, not uh, putting up a ca their own candidate because he was so famous in the world and Austrians love famous people. So uh, he was going into these elections as a winner. But and he would have won even more without this scandal. But actually he was forced into a runoff. Yeah, yes. Yes, so, so was. this did have this. Yeah. These revelations did have an impact. They On the did. end, he wound up becoming president yes. anyway. Yes, definitely, because he was. I mean, at the time, there were still many soldiers, former soldiers, alive, and they voted for him, even um, against their own party line. He was the candidate of these people, and there was a kind of. Uh, a huge wave of patri patriotism in the country, um, uniting against uh, the Jews, against the Americans, and we, a small country, we have to fight against these enemies, you know, all this bullshit. Even uh, the, uh, a former uh, chancellor who had uh, some Jewish had a Jewish background, he said, we're not going to let the Jews of other countries tell us how to run our, our country. Yeah, this Chancellor Brun Bruno, Bruno Kreisky was quite a problematic character because he was t came from a Jewish family, he was a socialist, and he was Chancellor, and he took uh, four Nazis, real Nazis, in his uh, first government. So, I mean, uh, there were many cases when... Was that just political expediency? Yeah, definitely. He had to pay a high price to become Austrian Chancellor as a Jew. 
I'm speaking to Ruth Beckerman, whose latest film is The Valdheim Vaults. It opens next Friday at the Metrograph here in New York. It is Austria's official entry for the this year's Foreign Language Oscar. And you're listening to Leonard Lopate at Large. What led, do we know what led Hubertus Chernin to begin digging into the records about Valdheim? Well, we don't really know. There were rumors already before. Um, yeah, there was this an article, I think, in the Atlantic, and then Solatz, uh, Congressman Solatz, had written this famous letter to Mr. Waltham asking him several questions, and Waltham didn't answer the question where exactly he had been during his war time. So there were all the time some rumors, and then... Did Solars get Chenin support in to, Congress? Pardon? Was Solars a lone voice or? Yeah. So uh, he wasn't really supported by other members of Congress at the time. At the time, not. But later, yes. And uh, and Chernin uh, based his uh, his investigation primarily on captured German wartime records that were held in the U.S. National Archives in Washington D.C. No, actually, Chernin went to our Austrian National Archive and found the card. It's kind of a card saying that he was a member of the Nazi riding circle and the Nazi youth movement. And Mr. Waldheim was not aware that this card is still in our National Archive. It was a membership card? A kind of membership mm. card, yes. So he actually, it's, it's not just a matter of what he did during the war. He was already uh, sympathetic to the Nazi cause when he was when he joined the Nazi youth. Yes, in a way. I mean, he was an opportunist. That's the main characteristics, I would say, to, about Mr. Waldheim. And it was in, in, he came from a very conservative, Christian background in the countryside, in a small town. His father was a school director who was harassed by the Nazis, who had to leave his job. And um, I think uh, Waldheim, as an opportunist, uh, signed up for these two uh, gr Nazi groups. But that was all. I mean, he could have made a big career uh, during the Nazi time, but he did not. He did not apply for any other party membership or jobs. I think he he was uh, intelligent enough to be aware quite soon that they will not win the war. But he was an officer in. He was an in the, intelligence officer. Yes. Yeah, so a, he knew a, a sub lieutenant, lot. or uh, we would say. Uh, Oba officer. Oh, Oba. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, well, Oba he was an intelligence officer in the, in the Balkans, so of course he knew a lot. And that's, he never talked about what he knew. In March 1986, as you mentioned earlier, the Word, World Jewish Congress held a press conference in New York that presented documents and a now infamous photo of uh, Waldheim in a Nazi uniform in 1943. How did the Austrian media react to that? Well, it's a Wehrmacht uniform, which means it's a uniform of the army and not SS or SA, mm -hmm. because he was he was a soldier. And the Austrians, well, they they most of them have been in the war as well, so they identified with him. But as more and more information came out, it was discovered that um, Oberleutnant, how would I pronounce that? My German is not good. Oberleutnant uh, Waldheim had been involved in the murders of, of partisans. Uh, um, no, he was. Ne he never was. Didn't didn't he? Wasn't he involved in sending partisans off to? No. Oh no, and this inf this those were never allegations by the World Jewish Congress. He knew about. He was an interpreter. We don't know if he was present when partisans were tortured. We don't know that. There's no proof of that. And he said that he wasn't aware of the 60,000 Jews from Thessaloniki mm. who, who were uh, deported to extermination camps. Yeah, that's crazy because he was located four kilometers outside Salonika. 
And the the most g amazing uh, statement by him is in a BBC interview when they said, so didn't you go back to and read some books uh, later to find out what happened when you were present in Salonika at the time? And he answered, why should I get back, go and, and read about something I hadn't known at the time? I mean, this is crazy. This is, but this is like our new chancellor, Mr. Kurtz, who is 33 years old. When he had been asked about the Holocaust, he said, I haven't been alive at the time. So, I mean, uh, I haven't been alive, alive in World War II either, but I read some books about it. I mean, yeah, this, is, this is the easy way out to say I haven't been around, I have been too young. And so. so what did Waldheim do after the war? He, he had gotten a law degree? Yeah, he got a law deg degree and in 47 he entered the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and started his career. And I think this was the real reason for him to lie about his past, because in 1947, Alexander Lohr, who was his, the general of the army group Waldheim was in, was hanged in Belgrade for war crimes. So I think that Waldheim didn't want to be close, have his name close to the name of Alexander Lohr, because everybody knew about that at the time. I think this was the beginning of this fake news he uh, told the world about his life. We, uh, we have in this country, uh, we've had uh, someone talking about alternative facts. Uh, this is nothing new, obviously. No, no, Waltham was the forerunner of, those, of this man you're talking about. No, that was Kellyanne Conway who <laughs> said there are facts yeah. and there are alternative facts. Mm -hmm. No. How did um, Waldheim deal with the, the growing body of evidence that was uh, was presented against him? Hmm. Well, he danced around it. He only admitted when a document was already put under his nose. That's why I chose this title, The Waldheim Walls, because it was like a dance that he <laughs> tried to, to, to not to admit anything as long as he could. He called it, and his supporters called it a smear campaign. Yeah. And he said they were pure lies and malicious acts. Now, obviously, they weren't lies at all. There was hard evidence. That didn't seem to face his supporters? No, because they didn't believe them. They believed him. They decided to believe him. I mean, we see that today in, with Mr. Trump. I mean, he says so many lies and people believe what he says because they decided to believe this person. And didn't some of his supporters suggest that this was all a Jewish plot to get back at him for welcoming Yasser Arafat to the UN? Yeah. So it was all about conspiracy theories. Again, conspiracy always uh, theories always work for many people. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, it it helps them get <laughs> get through a rough yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in 1986, uh, as he was running, and these questions about the Nazi uh, affiliations rose, uh, was there a growing opposition to his presidency? Of course. In the beginning, we were a small group of people, uh, as you see in the film, but. Um, slowly but surely more people joined in many very young people in in schools for instance in every school class there's the photograph of the president hanging so after he got elected many pupils turned the picture around and uh, there was a big big uh, change in in consciousness and in 1988, we had this commemoration year of the Anschluss, and there were so many uh, panel discussions and, and so on, TV um, documentaries, and uh, people started to, to, to revise their view of Austrian past. 
as uh, being more critical, but then things keep on changing, as we've seen in the recent elections. Yeah, is this course. because young people don't are, are unaware of the past, or because certain things just remain? Somebody once said, "Once you cross the uh, the Danube, you should expect most people to be anti-Semitic." Well, that's a stupid generalization, <laughs> but. Um as I said before, today it's not anti-Semitism which is the agenda, on the agenda, but it's immigration and xenophobia. And on the contrary, this extreme right, they try to embrace the Jews and to be very good friends with Israel, the Israeli government we have today, to, ha to have an excuse to be even more racist against other people. Has Austria been uh, a a place that immigrants wanted to come to? Germany has been much more welcoming, at least parts of Germany. Uh, but what about Austria? In, in uh, is, do people just come through? No, in 2015, Austrians have been very welco welcoming as, ger as the Germans and many refugees stayed in Austria. Unfortunately, this uh, mood changed a lot. Um, partly because uh, people, you know, for for a moment people are welcoming. They don't keep can cannot keep up with this emotion. But on the other hand, there every day uh, refugees are coming to Europe. So there is a real problem, and there should be a solution to that. I don't know. Nobody knows how this solution could look like, but. We are waiting for this. I saw another film uh, about refugees in Germany, and it was pointed out that uh, the people who are most in opposition are the people in the areas where there are few refugees. Of course. That's uh, also similar to anti-Semitism. I mean, uh, it was, it was m more fierce in places where <laughs> there are no Jews, and that's the same with the refugees. But in Austria, we have many villages who are very welcoming, who integrate them, who help them learn German. I mean, it's it's not black and white. But what's the situation today? Are, is uh, immigration being cl clamped down on? They try to reduce it, and today it's mainly Spain which accepts most part of the immigrants before it was Italy. Of course, the countries at the Mediterranean, they are the ones involved the most. That's why it's a problem that so many other countries like Hungary or Poland and Sweden don't want to take in more refugees. So they should be distributed all over Europe. And Europe needs young people. I mean, it's an old continent. We need people to refresh this continent and to take care of the older people. So um, they, well, there will be a solution soon. You said earlier that uh, you have spent a fair amount of time outside of Austria because you felt uncomfortable there, but now you choose to live there full time despite the current political situation. Well, the current uh, situation is a new one. And I think after all, uh, after this Waldheim affair, um, we won. You know, it was an unpleasant time, these months and years of discussion and of anti-Semitism and so on. But in the end, um, Austria became more open-minded, more liberal and much less homogeneous. There are so many people from other places living in Austria. So it's a pleasant place to live. And the governments that followed Waldheim uh, tended to be more more liberal, more left? Well, Walter was the president. The government was a coalition of conservatives and socialists for a long time. That's a weird kind of coalition. That was the normal coalition mm -hmm. in Austria. And only last year, the conservatives went into a coalition with the extreme right. So this is a new situation, and it's quite bad because we have a minis minister of interior who tries to censor the press, and they there are uh, Nazi songs and all kinds of Nazi things coming out of this party. 
but um, there's a lot of protest against it. So we'll see. Are you filming yeah. the protest as you filmed the no. protest of no. not for Waldheim? I don't. So uh, it's it's led to the kind of divisive situation that we've seen in other countries, including the United States. Sure, sure. And that's do you so think that's that we're normal. entering a divisive time? I mean, this is time? democracy. We have to, uh, and I think every generation has to fight again for its rights. And uh, democracy means also that uh, it swings to one side or the to the other. Now, we mentioned earlier that he was uh, prohibited from entering the United States uh, after it, all of these things were revealed because of a federal stra statute. And uh, he was persona non grata in most countries outside of the Arab world. But uh, interestingly, uh, in 1994, Pope John Paul II awarded him a knighthood in the Order of Pius the Ninth. Yeah, well, he was very Catholic. Oh, Mr. he. he, he they, yeah, he came from a Christian family, and he even in the film he says we have to uh, get back to our Christian values and so on. This uh, so much of this sounds like contemporary politics. <laughs> yeah. Are you surprised when you see people like Steve Bannon uh, rise to, uh, well, Steve Bannon's gotten very involved in European politics these days, encouraging some of the things that we've been discussing. Yeah, that's very dangerous. And the danger is that Austria is not alone today, and all these extreme right wing parties try to unite up till recent times, they were fighting against each other, um, also in the European Parliament. Uh, so this was a better situation. Now they found out that they are much more powerful if they unite. And Bannon tries to help them and put money into what he calls the movement. He opened an office in Brussels. So um, this is a very dangerous situation, and I hope that we will overcome it soon. Ruth Beckerman, B-E-C-K-E-R-M-A-N-N, -N, uh, is uh, the director uh, and writer of a new film called The Waldheim Waltz, which will be opening next Friday at the Metrograph in New York City. It also has been won how many awards? Six, <laughs> up till now. And uh, it, it will be Austria's entry into the uh, Academy Award sweepstakes for foreign language film. So who, if, if we have this very conservative government, who decided to uh, enter this into uh, <laughs> as, as an Oscar entry? Good question. I don't know. There is a jury of, of the different uh, film associations, jury of five people. I know only one of them, so, but they decided on it. And what was well, whatever reason? <laughs> and what was the response to the film when it opened in Austria? Amazing. I mean, it opened only last week, and we had, I think, uh, seven thousand entries already, which is a lot for Austria. Um, and uh, there are so many young people coming. I mean, it's packed. People have to go away. I mean, the cinemas are full, and. Um, this year, it, I didn't expect that the film will be so interesting for very young people. I think they, they tried to find um, ideas for their own protest in the film. Well, the, uh, the complaint in many parts of, well, in this country especially, is that millennials aren't as involved in, uh, in our politics as uh, young people in previous generations have been. Uh, I'm assuming something is similar in, is happening in Austria. It is, but maybe it changes. I mean, you know, there, there was this uh, these years now when they were all sitting at home uh, clicking on their laptops, but maybe that's boring already. So <laughs> they, they find out that it's much more fun to unite with other people and go out and discuss and protest in the streets. Well, you mentioned earlier that when you found the old tapes, you showed them to your son and his friends. And what was their reaction? Well, shocked and very interested in, in, in 
in in wahl time and in politicians who lie or who uh, distribute fake news or call it alternative facts and so on but waldheim was no longer the the president of austria at the time how aware were they of him not at all because i have to tell you in this country i i suspect that 99% of our listeners are totally oblivious to what goes on in austria Okay. Well, well no, but I, I can, but, but I can understand that. Well, but and uh, he's 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 forgotten, even if his his uh, picture is still hanging in the UN, of course, among others. Uh, but uh, he was not such an interesting person, and maybe that's why he's such a good screen, f such a good screen for all kind of projections. Um, it's kind of a Brechtian. You know Bertolt Brecht, who his his theater pieces. You know, it's like um, a Lehrstück. It's like a par par um, parable. I don't know. A parable. We parable. Say. Yeah. Uh, so maybe that's the that's why people are, can can imagine or think about other politicians and other situations when they see the film. I was just stunned by how so many people bought his story that he was wounded on the Russian front and then he just sat out the war when there must have been th many, many people who were aware of what actually happened, people who he worked with, people who he knew, and nobody said anything? <laughs> Apparently. Do you think that, well, is that typically Austrian or do you think that that just is uh, the way the world is? Yeah, I think they identified with him because they were soldiers themselves. And, um, they had done their duty, in, as he had called it. So the film opened in Austria last week, and it's coming here next week. Where else? Well, it's been touring since the opening in, at the Berlin Festival. Ah. And it's a very interesting. I've been at many festivals in different countries. And what was the German reaction to this? Well, it was like amazing and uh, it won this biggest award, documentary award in Berlin. And uh, they are very much afraid because they're of their AFD rising. But for me, an interesting reaction was in Spain, where the film is shown a lot. Well, they did have Franco. Yeah, and they, s they told me that um, they are now in Spain, where we in Austria have been in 1986, it's for the first time that people start to speak about the Franco time, Franco area, because there was silence about it. And it took so many years. Uh, he, Franco died in 1975, so it's crazy. So are school children being taught a more realistic view of, of Austrian history than they were yes. in the past? Yes. As a result of all of this? Yes. Definitely. And many school children come to see the film. It's booked uh, for months now for schools. Teachers come with the school classes in the cinemas to see the film. So this is great. You have another project in the works? I'm, I'm also doing installations, you know, and I'm, I have a project which is completely different to do an installation about James Joyce. Mm. That is totally different. Ah. And he never went to Austria, as far as I know. He did spend time <coughs> in Trieste. No, he has been in Austria f at this in Salzburg for six weeks, one summer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the installation will take place in Salzburg. Meanwhile, uh, I thank you so much for coming by to talk about this <coughs> film. Uh, I found it just eye-opening, the Waldheim Waltz, uh, it opens next Friday here in New York at the Metrograph. Ruth Beckerman, it's been a real pleasure talking with you. And that brings us to the end of our show. My great thanks to Ruth Beckerman, the director of the Waldheim Waltz, to Angela Sheldon, who produced this segment, to Charlie Morrow, who composed our theme music, to Jesse Lent, my assistant producer, who was at the audio controls. Lopet and Large comes to you on Saturdays at 4 and Tuesdays at noon. 
You can subscribe to Leonard Lopate at Large podcast on iTunes and by clicking on Robin Hood Radio's archive program site, which is robinhoodradio.com. You can also check out Leonard Lopate at Large Facebook page. We hope to see you next week. <laughs>